grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is good to gather again uh, to worship God. I'm glad to see you all. A word of welcome, especially to those of us who are new or for whom this is maybe one of the first few times you're visiting with us. I hope that you will meet God here and uh, find a place where you can do that on a regular basis. Welcome. We have our service this morning, obviously, and then tonight at five o'clock, we will have our first Eucharistic service since March 15th. So that's a good long while. We will be uh, having a drive-in style worship with Eucharist, five o'clock in the Eden parking lot. There are still some spaces left. So if you've registered, thank you. If you haven't, you're welcome to arrive. Um, but just know that once all the spaces are taken up, we'll have to stop letting people in. So um, if you would like to come, please do. It's gonna be a lovely, lovely service. Knowing that God is always among us, God is always around us. I invite you to welcome that presence into your consciousness that you would see and hear and know God as we prepare to meet God together in community in worship. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, 
is now and will be forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, let us adore him. A reading from Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they said, spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we all will stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sorry, I was unmuted. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, the one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and 
as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. And then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In God's name, amen. During this COVID crisis, Marty and I started to stay in really in the second week of March. So it's uh, been six months, five full months, a half of March at least, and a half of September. But we returned to a practice from our early years of marriage of reading a novel out loud to each other. It's a wonderful way to share the unfolding of a story together. And we usually do alternate chapters, although she often defers that I read more. She says preachers like to hear their own voice. Uh, but recently, one of our funniest reads was Richard Russo's novel, Everybody's Fool. It's a wild and crazy story, but with many insights into our human condition. And one that struck me was uh, a flashback moment of Sully. Sully's one of the main characters. He's about 70 years old at the time of this novel, Everybody's Fool. But he flashes back in memory to when he's about 18, 17 or 18, and he's, he's enlisted and he's about to go to World War II. And he's talking with Miss Beryl, a woman who really became his mother. She was his teacher in the school, but he, she was really his mentor and his honorary mom because of the deep conflict and alienation with his own parents, especially his mother. And so they have a few quiet moments in their last visit. And she says, she brings up the topic of forgiveness. And she says, we don't forgive people because they deserve it. We forgive them because we deserve it. Sully says, I guess that's something I don't understand. And she shrugs and says, guess what? I don't either. It's true, though. Well, maybe I'll feel more forgiving when I get back, Sully says. Well, do you know that there's such a thing as being too late, Miss Beryl says. And then the novel novelist reflects to say that Sully did know that there was something like being too late, but he understood that with a young man's comprehension, which was very confident, but very incomplete. So he goes off to the beaches of Normandy, as it turns out, witnesses the trauma of those dying to his left and to his right, and somehow, inexplicably, he survives and comes back home years later after the war. And when he returns, indeed, it's too late. His mother and father are buried side by side in the town cemetery. Too late for conversations of understanding and forgiveness. 
Sully had a young man's comprehension, which was very confident, but very incomplete about forgiveness. And that's something that can plague any of us throughout our lives. Incomplete understanding about forgiveness. It plagues the lives of communities. Think of the necessity for the Black Lives Matter movement. Obviously, all lives matter. But the emphasis on Black lives is a particular movement towards truth and reconciliation, a form of confession, really, and movement towards forgiveness for the sins of slavery and racism. Fogginess about forgiveness can plague a marriage or a family. My father and his brother became alienated over a lawnmower in the days following their dad's death, my grandfather. That alienation lasted for 25 years until the shock of my mother's sudden death early on a Saturday morning in 1979 shocked them into talking again and found a way back to reconciliation. And lack of comprehension about forgiveness can plague a congregation too. Our vestry members recently completed a rigorous six or maybe eight session seminar on conflict transformation offered by a Mennonite uh, reconciliation training group uh, to develop new skills and insights about how love and conflict and transformation, transformative relationships can be strengthened and facilitated. And I participated too, and I came away appreciating again that conflict in our Christian life isn't just resolved like a labor union contract goes into arbitration. No, in a faith community, conflict seeks to be and needs to be transformed, not just resolved, <laughs> needs to be transformed into forgiving, loving relationships. In today's gospel, and of course it's a wonderful story in the Genesis story as well about uh, incredible forgiveness from Joseph, but uh, in today's gospel, Jesus, uh, Peter comes to Jesus and he wants to know how many times he has to forgive someone. He says seven times, I guess a week. <laughs> Jesus says 77 times, and in older translations, it actually uh, came out, the numeration came out as 70 times seven, 490. Well, the numbers, of course, are all daunting, and they really suggest the issue is not accounting, but transformation in God's bookkeeping. God's forgiveness <clears throat> is bountiful, it's beyond numbers. That's what Jesus is saying. And Jesus is saying God wants us to participate in that. So Jesus says then a story, or tells then a story about a king who forgives once. <laughs> is very interesting, but it's complicated in some ways, but it's a real glimpse into the kingdom of God. The king is ready to be paid from all the debts that he's owed from. And so he, this particular servant owes him an impossible sum, a labor's wages that by some uh, commentators I consulted said might actually in today's economy be billions of dollars. So Jesus uses these exaggerated numbers to get the point across. And the servant falls down and begs for patience. And the king relents. And he releases him from the enormous debt. Because this is a merciful king. So the debt is outrageous. But so is the forgiveness. And then the story gets further complicated uh, because this same self-servant goes out and treats the guy who owed him money without any mercy or forgiveness. So it's outrageous in the opposite direction. And the story then gets almost ugly, if you will, because that same self-servant gets outed by the others and he's brought back to the king for his comeuppance. And he's labeled 
as wicked for his failure to forgive and return. And he's severely punished and he's imprint, imprisoned assumptively for the rest of his life. The lack of capacity for forgiveness, the lack of even an attempt on the wicked servant's part to transform himself, to work towards a plan of reconciliation and a settling of opinions and conflicts and grudges is severely denounced by Jesus. So this small-minded servant is held accountable for failing to participate in the grace of God that had been set in motion. And we might think, well, this guy got what was coming to him. But at the end of the story, the end of the parable, Jesus says, the same goes for you too. The same goes for us, the people of Emmanuel, the people of faith of Jesus throughout the world. If we don't work towards forgiveness, of our brother and sister from our heart, we will live in a broken place, an imprisoned place outside of God's bountiful mercy and love. This is not pie in the sky forgiveness. If we have been dealt with unfairly, God welcomes our anger and understands our pain. Forgiveness doesn't mean we lay down our dignity or give up on justice. People who need our forgiveness are not always sorry for what they did. And this, they may not actually even be finished hurting us. So work towards forgiveness on our part and in our heart is not equivalent to allowing abuse and hurt to continue. In fact, as full restoration might not be possible this side of the kingdom, but as Mother Jenny reminded us in her sermon last Sunday, Christian love does not mean being nice in some inauthentic way. It's much deeper. The love and forgiveness into which we are called by Jesus is honest, authentic, kind, and truthful. It does not overlook pain but looks through pain to the love of God in Christ Jesus. It's not by strength of our own will that we move towards this forgiveness, but by the willingness to be touched by the grace of God. And that rarely comes in an instant moment, but it arrives and starts and stops over time. In the novel, Sully stumbled towards comprehension of forgiveness. I could really relate to that. My father and his brother were propelled by the shock of a death to move more completely to forgiveness. It seems to me that God works always in mysterious ways. But today's gospel reminds me that nothing in this life is beyond the reach of God who creates and sustains all that is good. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. At this time, I invite anyone who is celebrating a birthday or any kind of an anniversary, either last week or this coming week, to let us know in the chat. Andrew Parker turns nine today. Happy birthday to Andrew. And mom and dad have an anniversary, okay. Jessica and Matt Schenke's anniversary as well, so Parker's and Schenke's. Birthday for Steve Cunningham. And Paul's mother-in-law, Jean, turns 94. God bless her. All right. And a wedding coming up in BC's family. Many blessings. All right. Well, I'm going to send this. It's my birthday, anyway. Happy birthday, Jim. OK. Then let's pray uh, blessings on all our brothers and sisters on these um, markers in their lives. Let us pray. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts, may your peace, which surpasses understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Okay, we're unmuted. God's peace, everyone. Peace. 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 Peace.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day, we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy upon us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we shall never hope in vain. O oh God, because without you, we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Prayers of the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Dion, our bishop, and for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for all the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for our enemies and those with whom we disagree. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and for those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for Elaine Carlisle, Bob Nelson, Thomas Jones, Sherry Kirby, Hillary Perkins, Barb Russell, Mark Jordan, Philip Polk, Bitsy Johnson, Pam Rosen, Joey Huber, Betty Cullen, Sydney Sutton, Sandy Baker, Mark Kloss, Mary Roberts, Jane Ann Tobel, Crandall Rogers, Alan Kelts, and for the, all those who come to us seeking sobriety, food, or any other human need, and for those we now name. I ask your prayers for a spirit of love and self-discipline that God would draw us closer in a way that we have never been before, working to control and elim eliminate the coronavirus, I ask your prayers for all those who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find him and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have, been, have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will, and those good things which we dare not, or in our blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions, as may be best for us, 
granting in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.